So without further ado, I'm gonna pass it over to Hisani who will kick it off. Thank you, everyone. Hello, everybody. Let's get the screen share going. And can you see a screen? Yes, awesome. See that, I always say step one is making sure the technology works. And I've given talks around, around AI and around bias in AI, and I like using the word robot for this. And a couple of times where I've given similar talks, the technology just stops working. And I'm convinced that there is a really sinister reason as to why, but I'm a conspiracy weirdo. So maybe that's just my imagination. So, so look, I'm going to, I'm going to talk through some examples. Um, I'm going to have a little bit of a section around how, how the technology works. And then I, I mean, I'm going to burn through all of that really, really quickly, because I want to get to some, some real world examples of, uh, I, I will say AI gone wrong, but but that phrase you might question that as we get a little bit through through this. When we get to those examples, um, I'm I'm happy to kind of like pause on them. We can talk about the ask questions. Let, let's have a dialogue around it if 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 you want. And then once we get to the end, we can have the 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 more sort of open across the presentation um, questions. So I'm willing to bet if you're anything like me that within the past 24 hours, Instagram has been on your phone and in your face. And it might have been in the past like five minutes. It might be right now because some of y'all's cameras are off and I don't know what you're doing. Um, and you'll note when you use Instagram, of course, that it's different from something like Twitter, for example, where Twitter's feed is chronological for the most part. And you see tweets come into your feed in the order that uh, they were posted by the people that you follow. And it's very simple. Unlike Instagram and, and this non-chronological version uh, of, of, a, of a feed actually really sort of personally annoys me. I, want, I don't want the robot to look at what I'm, what I'm seeing. I want, I want the pure, my friends sending me their photos right in Instagram. But as you scroll through, you know that uh, there is a robot or an algorithm deciding what you see and how you see it and when you see it. And that, that, that decision is being made without you having any insight into how it's being made or even any control over the fact that it is being made. Also in the past 24 hours, you've been on TikTok. I'm willing to wager a large amount of money on that too. Again, me, maybe in the past 10 minutes right before I joined this call. Um, and TikTok, very similar to Instagram, you know, it, it is artificial intelligence driven. So the posts that you see and the order that you see them are not up to you, nor is it based in, in chronological order, right? There is a, a machine learning algorithm or an artificial intelligence thing or a robot, we'll get to those sort of terms in a, in a little bit, that is deciding what you see and how you see it. And TikTok's a really interesting example. You know, Instagram takes in what it knows about you and some other bits of data to plug into these robots to decide what you see. TikTok takes it a step further. TikTok takes in all that information and feeds it to a robot, but it's also understanding how long you stay on a video. Do you watch that creator's video three, four, five, six times? Uh, and you can tell this by not having a TikTok account, downloading it from the app store and opening it and you're instantly seeing content because the robot that's controlling the behind the scenes uh, mechanics of TikTok is making assumptions and giving you the content that it thinks is, is really interesting. That, that is based on artificial intelligence. You probably also used a search engine. You probably used Google uh, and you probably used autocomplete because as you start typing, we start seeing Google's suggested search terms. Now, that is also artificial intelligence. There is not a team of programmers looking at every single search that comes through and manually connecting what they think you're trying to search for. There is a robot, there are algorithms that are looking at searches globally from, from the beginning of Google's existence and deciding with artificial intelligence what you meant. Uh, this specific example I always, I always find funny because Batman is, is shown twice. So th there is something around what the artificial intelligence is picking up from all the signals that it's taking. And again, we'll talk about how that works in a second uh, and deciding that, that you know, Batman versus Superman and Batman versus Iron Man is, is a thing that people are interested in, in searching for. Obviously, um, Iron Man would beat Batman, like hands down, no question, don't ask me. Even GPS, um, um, 
certainly recently is is artificial intelligence powered. So in the early days of of maps on early phones or even in your car, uh, like sites like MapQuest.com from way back in ancient history, the big technology issue to solve was the actual maps. Right? Can we have updated maps from around the let's talk about the country instead of the globe from around the country that are updated on a regular basis and can we with the gps technology pinpoint where you are in a map and then when you put in you know asking for directions and it shows you a destination in the old days that was a real i won't say it was a manual process but it was very slow and the, the specific technology used was not based in every other person's experience. So maybe you're noting a pattern here, right? When you open up TikTok, when you open up Instagram, the, the signals that are being fed to the behind the scenes robot, it's not just based on you and who you are, it's based on everybody else doing the same thing, just like those Google search results. Modern GPS, and not, not GPS as in the satellites, but the apps that use GPS, it's even Google Maps, for example, I want to get from my house to the mall. The artificial intelligence knows millions and millions and millions of trips taken over these roads, how best to get me there most efficiently, taking me from point A to point B. That's a robot making that decision. It's artificial intelligence. Netflix is, is an example of, of use of AI that you've done in the past 24 hours that I, that I really, really love. And I'll go through this quickly. Uh, two really interesting things. One, a uh, 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 not so well-known fact, uh, when Netflix, uh, so certain original series that are shot on Netflix, when they, you know, they're shooting every day and they take their dailies and they actually run their dailies through artificial intelligence algorithms to score them, to get a signal for humans to then decide whether or not this shot in this scene, in this show is going to be popular or compelling to the human audience. Uh, it's been said that Netflix's systems know if you're going to binge watch a new show in the first 15 seconds of you watching it. And then leads me to my second interesting story about Netflix. The thumbnails that you see while you're in a Netflix app, whether that's on your phone or on an iPad or on a smart TV, those individual thumbnails are actually, we'd all see the same thumbnails. And the decision as to which thumbnails to show which person is 100% driven by a robot, by artificial intelligence behind the scenes. So I'm a huge Star Trek fan, I'm Star Trek nerd, whatever you want to call it. And um, so I'm, I'm flipping through Netflix one night trying to find something to watch. And I see William Shatner, Captain Kirk himself, but like modern William Shatner, not 60s William Shatner, but like from like last year in one of the thumbnails. And it was clearly not a Star Trek show. And I'm like, oh, what is that? That's, oh, is, is there a new Star Trek series? Let me go, let me get information about this. It wasn't Star Trek at all. It was some detective show that he was in like three scenes in. But if you, anybody on this call, if you went to Netflix and you did not have the, the watch history that I have, and if, if your particular personal data set didn't match what the artificial intelligence algorithm thought was an appropriate data set, you would see a different thumbnail for that show. If you were a huge fan of the lead actress, you would see her in the thumbnail for that show. You wouldn't see William Shatner. That is not a human decision. That is a decision that's being made by artificial intelligence. So I say all that to say, you are using artificial intelligence every day of your life these days. It's invisible, it's there, it's like we're living in the future. Things just magically work and they work in a way that almost seems like science fiction compared to the way things worked even five years ago, let alone 10, 15, 20 years ago. And that's cool, right? Like robots are cute, robots are helpful. Robots help us figure out what to watch on TV and what TikTok videos we're gonna watch and how to get from my house to the mall. But obviously, um, like life, Certainly now, it really isn't, it isn't that simple and it isn't that easy and it's not as harmless as this fun little smiling, innocent baby robot looks. So let's take uh, a few minutes and ground ourselves in how these systems work. Um, I will say that I am not, this is not a math 
class. This is not a math quiz. There will not be a quiz at the end. Uh, trust math and we're not gonna get into that. Um, but it is important to understand the terminology and then it's important to understand how these pieces and parts work so that you can see where some of the challenges that we're facing as a society uh, are showing up because of how these things work. So there's, there's AGI, there's AI, and there's ML. AGI. AGI is artificial general intelligence. Um, if you're not familiar with this, with this background image, that's HAL from uh, an old film called 2001 A Space Odyssey. Um, because again, like science fiction guy, everything is gonna be nerdy in some way because it's about artificial intelligence. I'm using the word robot in the title. So, you know, deal with it. Um, HAL is the like almost alive computer that controls the spaceship in this movie. It is sentient, it is conscious. It is like you and me, but it's a computer. It is aware, it is aware of itself. It, it makes decisions on its own. It takes in information on its own. It, one could argue, and we're not gonna get into the philosophical ramifications of artificial intelligence during this session, uh, but you could argue that a artificial general intelligence is, is alive. It's just not a biological life form. Then we've got AI or artificial intelligence. Um, I, I, I think that a lot of us have, have seen and probably been really freaked out by uh, videos coming out of a, a company up in Boston called Boston Dynamics. And they've, they've built this, this dog-like robot and they've built a, a human structured like robot. And there are these really creepy videos of the robot running through the woods and doing crazy jumps and spins. Uh, there, there's, a, there's a great video of the human version of that robot and a person is sort of like pushing the robot and the robot just sort of stands. It's trying to knock the robot off balance. You also really don't wanna make the robots angry. Like it strikes me as such a bad idea. Um, so the interesting thing about, about their robots and about artificial intelligence in general is that the people who developed this particular dog-like robot did not have to write code to instruct the robot how to walk or how to jump or how to move. Not every single movement, right? Think about, think about telling a person who has uh, never tied their shoes before how to tie a shoe. When you're like list out those things in your head. Okay, you can go into, into minute detail in those instructions, right? It's like, bend your knee, lean down, put one string in one hand, put the other string in the other. And, and you, you see what I'm saying, right? There, there's gonna be this huge set of instructions. Now imagine you're a, you're a computer programmer and you're building out that huge set of instructions for every single possible move that this robot dog could make, you'd never finish, right? It, it, it would take you 30 years to, to, to code all of that sort of by hand. But what artificial intelligence is, is essentially computer learning. And the computer takes in signals and decides things to do with those signals based on a set of rules that a programmer has, has given it. So the Boston Dynamics team didn't, didn't code every single movement of this dog. They, they, they built in the basic mechanics into, the, into this dog's, uh, this robot dog, excuse me, this robot dog's uh, uh, system said, here's how your legs move. Cool. Figure out how to get your position from where you are right now to the other side of this room. Go. And that's it. And the way the math works in artificial intelligence, the, the robot dog tries one thing and then tries another thing and then tries another thing. And it's like trial and error, but it's trial and error beyond uh, from, from a speed perspective, way beyond what a human could do, right? The, 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 the computer inside this robot dog can try trillions of combinations in a couple of seconds. And eventually it finds, oh, this is what I have to do to move. And it does that over and over and over and over and over again. So from a, like the outside human perspective, it looks as though the, 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 it's actually like a dog, but a robot. No, it's just a, it's a piece of, of mechanics that through, through uh, uh, simulated trial and error has figured out how to walk, but it wouldn't have figured it out on its own. This is not something that's alive. We had to give it the basic rules of the world and we have to tell it what success and failure means. It doesn't know that it's walking. We have to say, yes, that's walking. Just like humans learn. In fact, 
the, the, the building blocks of artificial intelligence are based on you know, years and years and years of studying how human brains work and how human brains learn. And those, those, those learnings have been applied to, to computers. Um, so then there's, there's machine learning. And you'll note that machine learning is just a subset of artificial intelligence. So you've got artificial intelligence, which is computers that learn and make decisions based on signals that they get. Machine learning is a very specific way of training an artificial intelligence. And then under that, there are various uh, words that you'll, you'll hear these buzzwords thrown around all the time, like in media, uh, deep learning, neural networks, all these sorts of things are just simply different ways for uh, an artificial intelligence algorithm to be trained with, with data. And then you know on the other side there that the, the artificial general intelligence, the super cool, like actually alive thing, that doesn't exist. It doesn't, it doesn't. And we, we, we throw around the term artificial intelligence and I think for, for folks who are, who are not technologists, it sounds super scary. And it sounds like the, the machines are actually conscious in some way or making decisions on their own or could very quickly get to the point where they make decisions on their own. No, nah, that, is, that, is, that is not what we have now. Um, I, that's not happening anytime soon, like in our lifetimes. Now, I will say that that being said, 15 years ago, I would have probably said something very similar about the current state of artificial intelligence. So take that with a grain of salt. Don't make the robots angry because they might remember. So here is how machine learning actually works. Remember, machine learning as a subset of, of artificial intelligence, uh, how it works in, in three sort of straightforward and easy steps. So you start with input. And that, that, that's data, but it's, but it's data that, uh, represents something in the real world. Let's say that it represents, you, you have a list of recent car sales in, in a zip code. You've got 20,000 car sales. And in this list, you know the make, the model, the year, the color, and a couple of basic attributes. And if you look at a spreadsheet, right? You got a list of all of this stuff. And you want to build, uh, an algorithm or a robot or an artificial intelligence that can guess whether a very specific make, model, color, year combination, whether you're, whether you're able to get $10,000 for it. This is a terrible example, but I, I think you know what I mean here. So you've got on one end, your, your training data, your old data, the data of all of the sales that have happened in real life over the past year. And on the other end, you've got a question. You've got I have a 2014 Toyota, whatever, and it's got power steering and it's blue, how much based on this historical data would I get, right? So the middle part is, is where the work happens. Now, there's two ways to accomplish this work because you've got all this data and you can guess from the data where like an answer to that, to that question. Now, you could do it as a person. You could sit there and look through spreadsheets. You can make charts and graphs. I don't mean as a person, as in you're doing it by hand, right? You can still use spreadsheets and computers and sort of basic math to, to figure out an answer to that question, but it's gonna take you a while. And then you can't repeat it for a different set of data. You actually have to do it over again and over again and over again. But machine learning finds the patterns that you might not even notice as a human in that set of data, that set of data that represents the real world and knows where to look for the patterns once it finds the patterns. And then it encodes that pattern in what's called a model. It remembers what that pattern is and how to look for it. Okay, so I'll, I'll, I'll summarize that again. You have old data, you have training data, you have data that importantly represents something in real life. It represents the state of the world. It represents car sales or arrest records or smiling faces versus frowning faces. And then algorithms or just math equations, and it gets complicated, but it doesn't need to be. These math equations look at that data, find the patterns, and then remember the mechanisms behind those patterns. So when you feed that uh, robot new information, it says, oh, that person is smiling. 
I know that person is smiling because I have been trained on 7 million smiling faces and frowning faces and happy faces and confused faces. And I've been trained to know the difference based on this data set of real world old training data. But that raises a really, really interesting question. What happens if the training data is wrong? So with this car example, we're assuming that, okay, th th these are like receipts from car dealers or something, right? And, and the, the end result of how much am I gonna get for, for this car? Like whether it's off by 3,000, 4,000, it's not the end of the world, but that data the training data represents actual things that have happened. And it's a straightforward, you can make it straightforward mental leap from this list of car sales to a prediction of a car sale in the future based on that data. But here's where it gets sticky. And it gets sticky around what the, the definition of the word wrong means. Uh, so if the car data is wrong, it kind of, can't be wrong because it represents real life. A sale happened or it didn't. It happened at the price that it did or it didn't. Wrong in this case means in the training data, it said red instead of blue. It said 20,000 instead of 15,000. But like the, the basic part of why that data exists, the sale, the sale totally happened. Like you can't, there is, there is no wrong there. But when, when, when you start building and using artificial intelligence for, for different things, we start to see some issues. So here's where I'm gonna kind of, I'm gonna talk uh, fairly in depth about some of these examples. Um, if questions pop up, please. And then, you know, Sarah, if you wanna kind of pop on, cause I can only see a few faces here and then um, just interrupt me while I'm talking. Okay. <laughs> cool. So um, emotion detection is a thing that artificial intelligence can do. And you think about it and it's actually, it sounds like science fiction, right? You can upload a photo into uh, an emotion detection system or live video, and with a fairly high amount of confidence, the robot can tell whether the person is smiling or frowning or is confused or any of the, like, a, a range of seven to 10 emotions, right? And there are various ways to accomplish this. There are companies like Microsoft and Google and Amazon who have uh, systems that, that you as a technologist can use it, and build those into your own system. So you don't have to be the one to train the emotion detection robot. All you're doing is saying, I have a face. Hey, robot, is it smiling or not? The other way to do it is you have to find a million photos of smiling faces and a million photos of frowned faces and a million photos of confused faces. And that makes up your training data, like that list of car sales. And you're the one doing that training work. But that is a huge effort. Certainly when you're, when you're like, I'm gonna build uh, an app that turns on, that changes the color of my lights in my smart home based on my moods. I wanna go to a camera and smile at it. And be like, yo, what up? And the lights are green and blue and happy. Or I walk past it in the morning and I'm super tired and angry and then lights turn red and brown and are all creepy. Like, I, you, can, you can do that right now. So I tried it. Um, uh, about a year, year and a half ago, um, I, I gave a talk at uh, a, a conference, a technology conference, and the idea was that I was, I, I built, I was going to build this thing, and then I was going to talk about how I built it. And the talk was specifically for technologists. Here's how you change your mindset to use artificial intelligence as a development and programming technique when you haven't really done that before as a developer, because it's different, you got to think of things in different ways. But I ran into some really weird issues while I was making this. Um, so I, I built it out and it, it didn't take me very long and it was super cool and I'm, and I'm testing it and I'm smiling into the idea, sorry. The idea is you smile into your webcam and I had a, a, a lamp with a Philips Hue smart light bulb in it. And if you smile, the light would turn green and if you frown, the light would turn red. Like that's it, super simple, it was a proof of concept to then you know, go into the technology details. So I'm sitting at home and I built it and I'm super, I'm excited, all right, here we go. I'm smiling and it's like red. I'm like, okay, I screwed something up. Let me try that again, smile, red. I'm like, all right, well now I'm actually getting actively angry. So I'm frowning now and it's like red. 
like, okay, clearly I did something wrong in my implementation of this system. I, I got an extra semicolon in my code somewhere. I have no, like some sweet, I messed this up. So let me try it again. And I spent a whole late night getting more and more frustrated that I could not make the light turn green. So I go to the office the next day and I, I, I'm carrying my lamp and my laptop and I, I go to where my team sits and I say, hey, um, so I built this thing. And they're like, really, why'd you build a thing? Well, I built a thing because it's cool and I want to test it. I, I did something wrong here. Um, hey, producer, can you come over here and smile into the webcam? She came over and smiled, green. Like, oh, okay, that's weird. Another producer, come over here and smile, green. Frown, red, worked perfectly. So I went to another one of my team members, a black team member, and I said, hey, come over here and smile into, this ca into the camera. He smiled, red. And instantly I saw this pattern. If you had a white face, it detected your emotion 10 times out of 10 correctly. If you did not have a white face, it was wrong more times than it was right. So I did some digging like, well, it's, this is not my code. This is not the, the, the way I implemented the artificial intelligence. It wasn't, it wasn't that, it was the actual system I was using to detect the emotion. Uh, it was Amazon specifically. Turns out that the data set, that training data, that list of car sales that Amazon used to train their emotion detection robot didn't have enough brown faces. It just didn't. So the robot learn, it only can learn based on what you give it. And if you don't give it something that's representative of all of reality, then the robot doesn't know. The robot's not making a judgment call. The robot's not racist. The devs that built the robot aren't racist. They just didn't train it properly. So when I said a few minutes ago, it depends on the definition of wrong. Well, were those faces wrong? No. The faces that were smiling were smiling in the training data. I mean, the faces that were frowning were frowning. The, 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 the robot was trained properly, but the data was not fully representative of the real world. And training data has to be representative of the real world or it will not work. But you won't know that it doesn't work because it's invisible. You won't know that TikTok is only giving you certain types of videos. You won't know that Instagram is only giving you certain types of videos because you have no insight to how any of it works because we've done a really good job of taking all this crazy complexity and math and whatnot and hiding it behind slick, fun little interfaces. But it was, but it was, it was broken. Uh, over, the, over the course of the past year and a half, this has become a really well-known issue in technology circles. Um, you know, some... Some providers of the algorithms have said that we're gonna change the, 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 the training data. There've been great uh, research studies done out of MIT and Stanford um, around how to, how to make the training data better, how to test algorithms to see if their training data was bad because you, you can't necessarily trust the output if the training data was wrong. Image search. This one is a few years old, but it's another example of, of how training data that is technically correct, but does not actually reflect human society, so thus it's wrong, ends up with, with bias built into the robot, which then has a sort of bad end result, right? So actually, uh, um, there's been a couple of these specifically with Google. So a, uh, a, an acquaintance of mine actually put out a tweet and it spun this, up this whole controversy where a friend of his was in Google Photos on their phone and searching for like gorilla and images of black people show up. Huh, what? Now again, the first assumption is, wow, we got some like Ku Klux Klan members writing code over Google. No, no, it's the training data. If you don't have ac actual, accurate training data, accurate to the real world, not just accurate within the context of itself, you end up with robots that make decisions that to the robot is entirely correct, but to us, the humans, who should have looked at the training data to make sure that we're instructing the robot correctly, it's wrong. Another interesting example here, I don't have a slide for this, but. Uh, there have been a bunch of studies done 
testing these, these face, facial recognition algorithms. And, and there was one recent study where they took photos of United States Congress people and ran them through the algo to see, hey, so do you, do, do you recognize, robot, do you recognize this person? Actually, I will skip to that slide. Do you recognize this person? And some of those algos would come back and say, oh yeah, that's criminal. And most of the times when the robot said, hey, that's a criminal, it was a black or a person of color congressperson. So let's, let's, let's break that apart a little bit. How was the algo trained? Well, the algo was trained on mugshots. Were the mugshots correct? Was, did that person's face actually come from mugshot? Yeah, it did. Not this example, but I'll get to that in a second. Were the white faces that were in mugshots actual faces that were in mugshots? Yeah, so the data, was, the data was right, but it wasn't representative of reality. It just so happens that in the area where the, the algorithm creators pulled mugshots from, there were, there were more mugshots of people of color than there were of white people. Thus, the, the bias is built into the algorithm. If we know that's a problem, okay, we change the training data. But if we don't know what's a problem, we start to make really, really terrible assumptions and we build technologies and we build a society based on the outputs of these robots, not realizing that we told them and taught them the wrong thing based on data that was right, but it was wrong when you look at that data as compared to, to the real world. There's a very, very recent example. Uh, so th there, there was a man who was arrested because his face was marked as a match in a police search using facial recognition. And we all watch CSI and movies and whatnot, and it's like, key in and augment on sector number four. And it goes, boop, 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 and it zooms in, and it goes, boop, 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 and it spits out five people that could be. Yeah, we're not doing that, um, and we shouldn't be. And the, those who are doing it right now in America, here's a really good reason why we shouldn't be. This guy wasn't just like not guilty. Like he wasn't even in the state at the time the, 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 the crime happened. But they, the, the, the cops had uh, security footage of, of it was a good car driving, they had of, of the crime happening. So they had the, 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 the perpetrator's face and they ran it through facial recognition algorithms. And it went bloop, bloop, bloop. And it said, hey, here's a match. Here's his name, here's his face. The cops look at these two faces. And if you do some, if you do some Googling after this, um, you can look up this and you can see the, the two images, the image of the perpetrator and the image of, of this completely innocent man. They are clearly not the same person. Like clearly not, clearly not. But the cops say, oh, well, okay, we're gonna go arrest that guy. And they go arrest him. And he's like, what the hell? Like, I, I, what are you talking about? Well, your, your face came up. So, and it's like, that's clearly not me. Like, not only do I have an alibi, not only do I have like, you know, phone records and, and, and credit card records and like airplane tickets showing I was on the other side of the damn country when this happened, that face is clearly not mine. You, you arrest me? And uh, this, I hope there's a lawsuit, the ACLU gets involved. And then the cops are like, oh yeah, well, our bad, sorry. Multiple issues there, right? The robot was wrong, but the training data was wrong. And the training data made the robot wrong. And then over here, instead of just figuring out like, hey, show Husani uh, William Shatner so he can watch this detective show, a person got arrested and almost put in jail. What we are doing, we do not um, recognize how these things work, those three steps, training data, find the patterns, encode the patterns. When we're just assuming that it works and we don't dig into this training data issue, we are, we are like copying and pasting the, the bias and inequalities that exist in our society into the algorithms that more and more control our society. And because they're black boxes, because we can't open them up and see how they work, we don't even know we're doing it. So, the bias appears on multiple levels, right? The bias is, as I've said like 30 times by now, it is in that training data. And then thus it is in the application. Thus it is in the real world 
result of something in the real world being decided on purely by a robot without any human intervention. So I know I just like lit everything on fire, um, but like all is not lost because we're talking about this. I am not the only technologist in the world who is like shooting up uh, flares about this issue. And, and I, I think for this group in particular, as you embark on careers, regardless of what they are, it no longer matters, right? Marketing, STEM, art, sales, it, it doesn't matter because these algorithms are, they're invisible and they are in every single part of global culture, global business, global personal life. It's all there. So the first thing you need to be doing is just being aware of this issue, right? Like this is a thing. Don't instantly trust the algo and dig more into this. At some point later today, when you've got some time, Google up these issues and you'll, you'll see all of the, the, the news reports, the screen grabs that I had in this deck and dig into it a little bit. This is, this is a thing that is known and is becoming more and more talked about. But you gotta be aware of it first. If through your, your life and, and work, you know specifically that artificial intelligence or a robot was, is being used in a project you're working on or something, right? Ask how the system was trained. <clears throat> now you'll ask that question and the answer you will get is, uh, I don't know. And don't take that as an answer. Then ask that person to go find out how the algo was trained. Only when we have these conversations and they come from an awareness of how the systems work, can we have any hope of, of solving this problem before it really causes some serious level societal damage, more so than has already happened with, with Facebook and, and politics and so forth. And depending on what your career is, like keeping humans involved is super important. You will find, <clears throat> you will have bosses and bosses, bosses and bosses, bosses, bosses who were like, trust the computer. The computer said, X, so that's what we're gonna do, all right. No, I say this as a lifelong technologist, as a practitioner of these arts for my entire career. Keep the humans involved. Do not trust the output of the computer. Please don't. And if you are working on a team, and I don't care what level you're at, if you're rolling into an internship or you eventually become the CEO of the company, doesn't matter. Remember that we are doing, this is human, Stuff. This stuff happens in the real world and human lives are, are impacted by this. As silly as what to watch on Netflix or as serious as going to prison, this stuff really matters to, to us as people. And as you're doing all that, if you see, you see something, say something. Like raise your hand and be like, hey, this, this output of this robot doesn't feel right. It doesn't actually, doesn't feel reflective of what I know to be the reality that I live in because I've lived in it for some years. Like it doesn't feel right, point it out and figure out with teams what to do about it. Or just simply raise the question and continue to raise the question until we kind of make sure, and you make sure in your broadening circles as you begin your careers and go out your careers, that this is an issue that we're all still talking about. That's what I got and I would love to have some questions. Okay. That's terrific. Thank you for that. Um, if there are any questions, I'd be happy to um, take you off mute so you can ask them to Husani directly. Any questions? Come on, guys. I know you always have questions. What I love about tech stuff is that there literally is no such thing as a stupid question. Like, I think people always, people who are not technologists think that we always have all the answers. So the like questions are weird, but trust me, every day is like a technologist's first day sitting at a computer. We, we don't know anything. So <laughs> please ask anything. Okay, Jason has one. Let me get him off mute. Um, hang on, let me scroll down here. Okay. Hello, can you hear me? Hello. Hey. Hello. <laughs> I have a question, Zani. Uh, so, so now you've just given us this brilliant talk about AI and machine learning. So is it still important for us as students to learn about data? 
now we have all these data training technology. And what should, mar my, my second part of that question is what should marketing students know about data? That, those are that's great questions. Yes, you should still know. It's sort of like, you know, you should know how to boil water and you should know some kind of basic food techniques, even if you're never going to be a chef. You should know how the pieces work. Um, you know, when you look at how things like technology and, and such, regardless of the technology, how things are now, um, as opposed to how they were like when I was just kind of starting in my career, back then you could open things up either physically or with code and figure out how they worked. It was very, like I was the little kid who took apart my parent, like the house phone and was like poking and prodding and doing wires and whatnot, because you could do that. And it, it taught me so much about how these things work. And I apply that knowledge sort of you know, throughout my career. You can't do that anymore, right? Like you're not opening this up. You, you shouldn't like Apple's going to come find you and yell at you for doing it. So you can't really learn how those things work. So as much as you can understand, you have to understand. And data in particular, every, it, it is everything now. We are at a point where there will be continued exponential growth in the use of data, either, either via artificial intelligence or just data in general to make decisions. You should understand how data is structured and what it is and where it comes from before, you know, to, to be able to live in, the, in this, this current world. In terms, of, in terms of marketing, students, yeah, yeah 100%. Like, look, we, we, are, we are a full service creative agency at Deutsch. Um, we, we care about brand, we care about strategy, we really care about creative. But there's a data underpinning to all of that. Um, creative does not exist in a vacuum. Art does not exist in a vacuum. Um, we have tools now that allow us to get insight into how to think about creative campaigns or how to think about where to put those creative campaigns. So the more you understand about how those systems work, the better your work will be, regardless of the area of marketing that you're in, whether you're a creative or an account person or a technologist or whatever, knowing how those parts work is super, super important. Thank you. Kim, I'm going to ask you to unmute and you can ask your question. Can you hear me? Okay. Yeah. Sure can. So um, I was just going to ask like what's your take or opinion or if you even want to explain like your take on voice AI and smartphone privacy and how like that branches like how ethically that's acceptable for like marketing and advertising initiatives. Um, could you elaborate what you mean by for marketing and advertising initiatives? I know what you're saying, but I want you to like that a um, bit. on TikTok. I've seen like a video of someone saying a bunch of words associated with pregnancy and babies and stuff on her like husband's phone, and then like while it's off, like screen off like this, just saying it into the phone, and then he started getting a bunch of advertisements on Facebook and different platforms, social media platforms with um, pregnancy and baby like ads. So like stuff like that, or just having a casual conversation, like my friend was talking about Jeeps with her dad. And then she started getting a bunch of Jeep at, like ads. So like, I wanted to ask what your take on that is. I love that. I, thank you for that. I, that's a great question. And, and I, I can say sort of unequivocally that marketing technology and ad tech does not from a agency perspective and from a technology perspective and from a like brand client perspective we are not listening and we can prove that we're not listening so like data goes in and out of this thing right and technologists have have pretty straightforward ways to sniff the the ins and outs like i could hook it up to my laptop right now and i could see every call that is made from my phone to get my email or to get instagram or to whatever so i can i can't see the data necessarily but i can see where it's going and where it's coming from you can do that and like run this experiment like the video you're talking about i've seen a bunch of those and there and you don't see any data going back and forth because here's what's happening and this sounds weird but just trust me on this we all think that we are like special um, and we are, everyone is special, but like we're not that special. Here's what I mean. Um, the algorithm knows more about you than you do. 
because it's got records from billions and billions and billions of, of moments in other people's lives who are like you and who are not like you. So the, like the, the Jeep thing, it's not so much that look, look, Jeep ads will follow you around because you like looked at tires, or look, you looked at a Jeep on an Instagram one day, but they might also follow you around because you watch a television show where that particular episode there was a, a Jeep plot line or some other connection. Like the algorithms are making connections that seem like non-logical to us. So we think that like, oh, it, like, it must have heard me say it, but no, you have done something you're at, or you're at a point in your, your existence as the marketing algorithms know you where the robot says that person is susceptible to a Jeep ad at this moment, not necessarily just because they search for something very similar. It's super, super, super complicated, the number of variables that are involved, and it makes it seem like it's BS, but it really is not. And if it were, I would quit this industry because I think that's the most <laughs> privacy busting thing to ever exist. It would be an awful, awful thing. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, Mayumi has a question in the chat box. Uh, she wants to know if you think machine learning can actually detect its own bias. Ooh, these are really good questions. <laughs> Whoa. Um, yes. So there is a technique uh, that, that, that is more and more used um, called explainability. So, you know, oftentimes, so a model is either explainable or it's not. And a non-explainable model means I smile into the thing and it says, smile, and I'm nine, I, the robot, I'm 94 and a half percent sure that that's a smile, but that's it. Now, explainability gives more. It says it's a smile, I'm 94.5% sure, and here are some reasons why I think that is a smile. I'm pointing out where the edges are. I'm showing the shape of it, so it gives more information. So while while the, the, the model them, itself won't necessarily know that it's biased, it's giving the user of the model more information about how it came to its conclusion and then it's up to the person kind of to decide whether, you know, why it came to that conclusion. That being said, there is a lot of research being done like right now around how to automate even beyond that explainability level, how to automate the finding of bias in models. And I, I, we will get to a point with the technology where the models will detect the bias in other models, if not itself, and then we'll be able to do something about it, perhaps more in, in an automated fashion. Okay. Um, there are a couple of questions here in the chat about TikTok, um, and the implication here is that it's more problematic or threatening than some of the other social media platforms. So what's your perspective on that? Yeah, I don't disagree with that. Um, you know, look, everything that is a, a black box and certainly like a technology black box. So what I mean by that is you don't know what's inside. There's like, you can't open it. There's just, it does, it does stuff in there and then it spits something out and you don't know how. Like that's what TikTok is. Um, and it's, it's probably, it'd be problematic. Like Instagram is a black box and Facebook's a black box. Even as, as marketers, we don't know how the algos work. We're, we are guessing like everybody else for the most part. Um, TikTok is, is, is potentially dangerous simply because of China. Simply because of, of what, where ByteDance is, 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 is owned. And so, you know, it, it is up. I do not think it is, it is um, like a, is it a risk to national security? No, 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 I wouldn't go that far. But technologists can certainly, like, like I said, look at the data ins and outs on the phone and see what's going where and start to draw some conclusions as to how it's, how it's being used. But all, all of this technology um, is potentially problematic and is potentially dangerous. Um, and it's up to all of us. And by us, I mean society, but very specifically, communications people, marketing people, and technologists to think about the ethical use of this stuff before we just say it's cool or it's a good idea, let's do it. You gotta kind of flip stuff on its head, right? The tech behind TikTok is super awesome. What if it were you, what if the person who ran it was evil? What then, right? Would the tech still be cool? Yeah, it would be, but the use of it is bad. So maybe we should start thinking about, uh, it's like you wanna think negative, negatively. How can this thing 
And I think this is, this is a way to think about, about creation, even outside of things like TikTok, like a marketing message or a platform or a brand. How could it be flipped on its head and used poorly? Like everybody knows 4chan and 8chan and whatnot. Like if 4chan or 8chan got a hold of this thing, how would they abuse it? We got to think of that kind of stuff as we're developing marketing messages, as we're working with clients, as we're developing technology to make sure that we're grounded in, in ethics. Okay. Um, Sherry wants to know if, uh, is, is there any way for a computer to unlearn what was previously inputted? Um, or is it just based on putting in new data that's more reflective of reality? You would put in new data that's more reflective of reality. That's a great, that's a great point. Actually, that's a really good question. Um, the model can be retrained, right? It's, it's never, it's not sort of one and done carved in stone. You got to like break it and start over. You train the model again and the pattern potentially changes based on a new set of training data. So it's not as though the work that a lot of people have done to build these models has to get tossed. Now that we know that there's bias in the data, we just need to fix the training data and then retrain the, the, the algorithm. And um, I know you mentioned this before about AGI um, potentially not existing in the future, but I mean, what, what are your thoughts on, on the possibility of that? Because you did say before that you didn't think that uh, AI uh, was, was going to be as possible as it is. So um, what, what, what's the potential there for that? Look, we used to think that the moon was made of cheese. So <laughs> like, <laughs> you know, I, I, history has shown us to bet on humanity. Mm -hmm. um, and every time we think something is completely impossible event, it's just probably because we just, just a thing we don't know yet. And eventually we figure it out. Um, I am convinced that at some point, artificial general intelligence will absolutely exist. It, it, it almost has to. Um, and as, as quantum computing, and I'm kind of looking at faces to see whether I get frowns of confusion or like nods of, I've heard of that before. Uh, so quant just quickly quantum computing being like exponentially different than normal binary computing. Uh, you know, binary is one or zero. Think of quantum as one or zero or like mm, both or, or neither. Like it gets super, like it sounds super mystical, but it's just math. And what it allows, the, the fuzziness of the math allows for exponentially faster and different types of things to be made, we will probably eventually make artificial general intelligence. Um, but we probably should right now figure out how to do artificial intelligence right. Because it's, ba it's bad enough when these algos are not self-aware. But like, I don't want Arnold Schwarzenegger knocking on my door. <laughs> Okay, Kim. Well, that would be cool. That would be cool, actually. Yeah, that would be, <laughs> yeah, that'd be cool. But you know what I mean. <laughs> okay, Kim, you have another question, so I'm going to unmute you. Go ahead. Um, this is AI related, but kind of random. Like, another opinion type of question. Like, what do you think of Vector? Like, the robot? The little robot? <laughs> like, do you trust it? Or, like, I kind of want one, but I'm like, I don't want someone to hack my Vector and can see me or something. Yeah, look, like, it's cool. I'm sorry. It's cool. All this <laughs> stuff is cool. It's cool. And like, I have, I mean, it's like Alexa, right? Like, yeah, but what, it has the camera and it can detect. Yes, uh, but it's, but what we've done, and what we all seem to be okay with is like, let's put cameras and microphones and artificial intelligence in front of us 24 seven, nothing bad could happen. We're trusting it's all going to be fine. Like, I'm not, I, it's a lot of this stuff. It's like, I'm not worried about the tech itself. I'm worried about, to your point, somebody hacks it. Mm -hmm. Right? Like, I'm, I'm, I'm worried about, hell, if someone doesn't hack it, but it, there's a bug in it. Right? Like, it, it's, it's the, and then someone takes advantage of that bug to then do something. The, the problem with all of this stuff from from my perspective anyway is like it's the it's the humans which means we got to fix the tech to make sure that it can't be taken advantage of by the humans mm -hmm. but like also it's friggin cool i really like being able to walk into my bedroom and say like computer turn on the lights and like it does and i want a robot that does things and like we live in the future it's awesome to take advantage of that future um but we got to do it with like an eye open and an ear open for the stuff that could go wonky 
Okay. Thank you. But if you get one, send me an email. Let me know how it is. Oh, yeah. I'm going to get one now. <laughs> Hi. Any other questions? So I actually have a question. Um, since uh, most of the people on this talk um, are interested in marketing and advertising, what's the overall implication of all this exciting technology and data and AI? Um, for people who are entering the industry as, as new marketers? You have to understand that this stuff exists. And by this stuff, I mean the entire landscape of, of what's happening in technology, on the internet, how all the, the behind the scenes stuff works. You don't need to be a computer programmer to be an excellent modern creative marketer. But you do need to understand the landscape and how these how these things work. Like, if if you were alive back in like the 60s or 70s and you wanted to go into you were working at agency and and write tv scripts you would own a tv first right you'd have an understanding of like there's this screen in people's homes and they sit around with their families and they watch it at eight o'clock it's called prime time like you would you would understand the like the mechanics and i don't mean the like how it works mechanics you understand the basic mechanics because TV is TV is TV is TV. Storytelling on a screen is storytelling on a screen. Um, but where we're at with technology now, it's like a, another whole level of detail. And that detail actually matters in, in crafting a marketing message as a creative, uh, with coming up with, with the strategic underpinnings of that message as a strategist, uh, how to work with clients as an account person, right, where these marketing messages should live and how people interact with them as a, as a media person, like every role within, and this is just agency side, right? Even on the client side, it gets even deeper. Um, you've got to know the landscape that we're playing in uh, to be an effective marketer, whether you are creating the message or the message is being created on your behalf. Um, and it'll give you a superpower um, that other folks may not have because you understand the medium that, that we are now playing these messages in. Ooh, that's good advice. Thank you. Okay, any other questions for Husani? Anything else? I don't see any other hands raised or any. Oh, wait, Emma has one. Emma, I'm unmuting you right now. Hi, I really enjoyed your talk. So I started to learn about bias in machine learning with the Google and Gorilla article that came out a few years ago. But for those looking to get potentially more involved in machine learning, bias in machine learning, what would you kind of recommend? Like, are there courses or programs that you've heard of or created that you would recommend to those who maybe don't have the time to pursue it as a degree, but are really interested in it on the, interested in it on the side? Um, yeah, the, like seriously, just like go Google some stuff. But what I really mean by that is find the people on Twitter who are talking about this stuff and follow them. Like if, even if you're not using Twitter, make a Twitter account just to follow those people because there are folks that are that are actively uh, researching and experimenting and not necessarily from like a deep technology implementation uh, uh, place, but from a like use place, from a storytelling place and from a technology place. Um, and they're super like uh, uh, open and want to talk about it and, and will engage you and will speak in like, non ones and zeros language that you understand it. There are some awesome folks on Twitter. Okay. And we have one more question coming in on the chat. Jenny wants to know, um, what are the, what's the bias in the social media algorithm? Are there any? Yeah, I, well, I, I think we get into, into uh, the concept of an information bubble. Like one, one of the grand goals of of the consumer web and, and then the internet as a whole like back in the day was we get to connect people from all over uh it doesn't matter who you are or what you look like and none of that matters we're just like we're just humans talking to humans on the other side of the globe and it's the first time that in in our species history we could do that in real time like i remember being a kid and i won't Tell you what system i was using because it tells my age but it was way before myspace and like the cool factor of talking to some other like 15 year old who lived in like uzbekistan like that was just the most amazing thing right 
But what social media has done is because, frankly, because of, of, of marketing reasons, like we need to sort of take messages and give them to the specific people that we want to have them. These robot curated news feeds only give you certain types of information. And if you're not necessarily aware that that news feed is making decisions for you on what you see, you just think that's like all that that is. When a person right next door to you has an entirely different set of information because of, of who they are. So we end up in these little information bubbles where like fact is no longer fact and truth is no longer truth. And our own personal biases, whether conscious or unconscious, start to get reinforced by the algorithms that only show us the content that we want to see, only shows us what we want to see. And we see, we've seen that politically over the past four years. That, that's how we've ended up in the political state we are in in this country. These information bubbles that keep us only talking to those who agree with us or only getting the information from sources that agree with us. And we're just, we just think we're on Twitter or Instagram or TikTok or Facebook and we're putting ourselves in these little, these little bubbles and it's a, it's a real problem. Um, and we gotta, we gotta figure out a way around that. Okay, well, hopefully the people on this call will be some of the ones that figure out how to, how to fix that problem. Uh, okay. Absolutely, let's do it. Let's do it, awesome. Okay, so I think that's it for questions. So I just wanna thank Vasani again and, and really the whole team at Deutsch because you all have been so wonderful to work with, but um, this was such an amazing presentation. I know I learned a lot. I know everyone on this call did. Um, just fascinating, amazing, cool stuff. So thank you for that. Um, before everyone goes, um, we have another session next Friday at 1 p.m. with Janal Shah. She's the VP of Marketing at Feather. Um, and Feather is a direct-to-consumer furniture company, and she's actually worked at several of those types of startups before. So if you're interested in startups and direct-to-consumer, um, which is like the hot new trend right now in the industry, I definitely recommend you uh, register for that event next Friday. So thank you again, everyone. It was great seeing you all. Enjoy your weekend. Thank Bye. you so much. Thank you.